uh, look at the word discipleship. Um, <clears throat> part of the word means to come alongside of, is what the word means, okay? You come alongside of somebody and they teach you. So I had a guy call me a couple weeks ago. Uh, he played basketball at Stone Mountain High School, and um, that's where I played ball at. And he told this uh, friend of mine that was a pro player that his mentor in basketball was actually me. And actually, I didn't know that until Horace told me that uh, on the phone. But what I didn't realize was he was watching the whole time, mimicking things I did on the court and stuff like that. And he became a really good player himself. In the world. Okay, so someone's coming alongside. Uh, hey, Christian. Is your name Christian? Yeah, just say. And uh, stand up for us. Hey, you, man. All right, now I'm going to ask you a question, all right? Do you, know what, do you know what this is? A track. That's a gospel track. So if, if, if you have a gospel track, what are you supposed to do with a gospel track? Give it to someone else and tell them to give it to someone else after they read it. Yeah, just let it go, mm -hmm. and go right? So, so how did you learn how to hand out or give out gospel tracks? Chris. Oh, yeah. Chris told me how to. Was it I heard a rumor at church on Sunday that you watched Chris do it, and then you just kind of mimicked, and then someone told me you like <coughs> hand out a lot of gospel tracts. Is that correct? Oh, that's correct. Yeah, so that's that's what that's what discipleship is. You come alongside somebody, you learn from them, and then you put it into practice. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Anything you're good at, you practice. Don't forget that. Anything you're good at, you practice. What's your name? Mark. Mark? Mama. Tell me something you're doing. Mama. Yeah. Drawing. Who? Drawing. Drawing? Like you a pencil sketch or what do you do? Yeah. Really? You got like a portfolio, like a book, a book that you said? Really? Uh, who in here has seen any of Mark's drawings? Uh, oh, he's drawing the second thing? You've seen some of his drawings? Yes. Good, bad, average, what do you think? It's really good. Really good? Um, uh, is it getting better as time progresses? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's part of drawing. It's your arti artistic, not autistic, but artistic. <laughs> Pronunciation is everything nowadays. Um, so I used to teach in all boys' schools. So my artistic <laughs> boys, oh man, ooh, they just got better through time. Okay. Who, who, was that you uh, with the soccer ball out there? That was you, right? Yeah. He, he, he picked up a basketball. But instead of using your hands, you used your what? Your feet. Okay, and you were juggling it. How many times can you juggle that with your feet? About 30. Going on. 30? That's pretty good. Um, do you remember when getting to two was hard? Yeah. Getting to three was hard? Yeah, most of us regular right people, we understand that, right? <laughs> but you can't get to 30 juggles until you get to what? One becomes two, two becomes three, watch out. You can do better. Okay. Uh, Sierra, tell me something you're good at. Uh, piano. Okay, do y'all know that about Sirach? He's like a world famous pianist. Okay. And he went to college in the same town my dad went to college in, Lincoln, Nebraska. He's like amazing. So Sirach, have you gotten better at piano since you, you told me you started at 10? Now, what are you like, 56, 57? How old are you now? 38. I was close. And um, so are you better at 38 than you were at 10? Yeah. A lot better? Yes. Yeah, because hours and hours and hours of practice. And then you go with certain teachers that can teach you certain things, right? So you yeah. train under different teachers, and now, boom, you're amazing at 38, okay? So keep that stuck in your head. Write that in your notes. Anything you're good at, you practice. So I never worried about someone on a basketball court being better than me because I knew I could, what, practice and get better than them. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. Um, I'm a 10th grader in high school, and I averaged, uh, what was it, uh, 12 points a game and 10 rebounds a game as a sophomore in high school. Can that get you a college basketball scholarship, yes or no? No. No. It's not good enough. Okay, so I went to the principal still on high school. I said, Mr. Johnson, I want to come in this summer um, from eight o'clock in the morning to twelve noon, four straight hours in the gym, the gym that still sits right over there, 
and I want to shoot hoops in there for four straight hours every single morning. Okay? He said, wow. He said, I've never had anyone make that request of me before. I said, okay. He said, okay. He said, I'm going to let you do it. He said, but you just can't bring anybody with you. It just has to be you. I said, okay, fine. So I walk up there with my, with my jump rope. Anyone know what a boom box is? Yeah. Old school boom box. I'd have a boom box with me, put it up there. And I would go in that gym and shoot four hours every single morning, 8 to 12, okay? Um, uh, it can be a little boring by yourself in a gym for four hours sometimes. Yes, and uh, it can be, okay? But at 12 noon, at 12 noon, a lot of teenagers at 12 noon in the summer, what are they doing? They're getting up. And every day they were getting up at noon, I got four hours better than they did. Four hours better the next day, four hours better the next day. In my junior year, I averaged uh, 24 points a game and 14 rebounds a game. Will that get you a college scholarship? Yep, everybody wants you then, right? But I just had to put the time, the effort, and the practice in there, all right, to get what I wanted from that sport and do that, okay? So sometimes you got to dare to be different, okay? And anything you're going to be good at, you got to practice, okay, and do it. All right, grab your Bibles for me. Let me see your Bibles. All right, let me see your Bibles. Okay, if, you, if you're using it on your phone, uh, nothing but your Bible. Don't go anywhere else. No apps or anything like that. Hold them up for me. Young man, you got one? Yeah. Phone? Okay. You got that? We have a bunch of Bibles in that box. The box has one if you want a hard Bible. Okay. Okay, now, a couple things. Make sure, down for a second, make sure at your house you have a hard Bible at your house. Okay, because there's, and you should have a bunch of them, actually, not a bunch, but you should have some you can take and do what with them? Cross Study and then cross-reference or give them away. Okay, because does anyone know what an EMP bomb is? Anyone ever heard of an EMP bomb? What's, a, what's an EMP bomb? Right, electronic, magnetic, what is it? Electromagnetic pulse, and what does it do if a bo if one of those goes off? So it destroys all the electricity underneath when that bomb goes off. So if an EMP bomb ever goes off, the whole key is the height of where the if it goes up too high, it's not going to affect it. Too low, you just get a little area. So actually, in the military, a lot of um, uh, bunkers they put the bunkers covered in copper. Because copper will block an EMP, EMP bomb coming through there and knocking out all of your uh, electronics and things like that. So they're actually ready for one of these to come. Okay, so think real quick. If one of those went off and you lost your electronics, okay, just pop a hand up. Don't everybody scream. Let's pop a hand. What, what, what would be something that would not work if one of those went off? Christian? Oh, your, your phone wouldn't work. That's exactly right. Your phone is toast and do that. Raise a hand up. Tell me something else that wouldn't work. Okay, so your computers and laptops aren't going to work as well. Very good. Okay, tell me something else. Your TV's toast. It ain't working. Okay. And by the way, when you get to make your own decisions in life, don't waste your time on buying a TV. Oh, Chris, wasn't I at your place after church on Sunday? I was. Was there a TV in your house? No TV? So what did we do? We sat there and what? Talked. Talked. That's exactly right. We had a nice, very nice time. But if that tube would have been on, we would have wasted a lot of time. Tell me something else that wouldn't work if an EMP bomb goes off. Oh, yeah. like, appliances. Your appliances aren't going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Tell me something else. Your lights aren't going to work. You ever had the power go off and you walk in a room and it flipped the switch? And do that? I do it all the time. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's no power. Why am I flipping this? But you know how you just train yourself to do all the time? With something else. Microwave is toast. Well, you can't make toast in the microwave. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, uh, Wi-Fi is history. Anybody 18 or 16 or older? Okay, what's something else that won't work, you 16-year-olds and older? Flip phone's not going to work? What else? What, what do most people do at 16? No, you do, gosh, you do that much younger than that. At 16, what do you normally get at 16? No, you don't, I hope your parents aren't giving you a car, but at 16, you get a what? A dog? Oh, a job. A dog. That's a good, good job. 
You get a driver's license, okay? So what is something that won't work if an EMP bomb goes off? Cars aren't going to work. They don't even think about that, okay? So if everything goes down, you, you need hard copies of books, Bibles in your place. Do, do, do any of you read like on Kindle and things like that? Okay, so they teach us if you like a book, uh, have a hard copy of it in your house. Because do you know what Kindle is? So you get a, what's an e-book. What's an e-book? Electronic book. So that means Amazon is sending a book to your phone. Correct? That also means Amazon can what if they feel like it? They can take it back if they feel like it. You ever thought about that? In England, um, they they said some book was, uh, they didn't like certain words in this one book. And England's crazy about language. They're, they're so far gone. It's, 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 I hope it doesn't happen here. People went back to their Kindle to relook up that book. It was a kid's book. And Amazon had already changed the wording in the book they had on their phone. And they bought the older book. And the people messing with you already got into your phone and messed with it. That's how crazy this world is. Okay? So if you, if you, if you ha get hard copies of books in there, okay, put in your notes. To be a leader, you got to be a reader. To be a leader, you got to be a reader. Who are you, man? Hey, Amari. Where? Of course I did. Hey, am I? And um, was the pizza good that night? I hope it was. So one thing I probably said to Amari was this. Um, if I take your T-shirt, you can go to Walmart and get another T-shirt. If I take $10 out of your pocket, you can go get a job and get $10. But once you have knowledge, what? Nobody can take it. Nobody can take it. You can write a book with that. You can start a business with that. You can mentor somebody with the knowledge you've got. Okay? But one of the tricks is, especially to you young men, you go into a gym and what's, what's, what's on every single wall in the gym? Mirrors, because they want you to look at the outside and not the who you are, right? Um, so that's why I tell people, you know, you're looking for these muscles, build this up. Build this brain up, okay? And then you've got things. I had an atheist one day in a coffee shop. I was witnessing. He said, sir, you answered every single question I threw at you. Well, I've studied. I know some things. I'd like to help people out with their questions, right? But that may not have been true 10 years ago unless I'm reading and studying and putting things before my eyes and building my brain up. Who knows what the NAACP is? Who has heard of the NAACP? Okay, someone tells me what the NAACP stands for. I think it's a national advancement or... Association of for colored people. Okay, now we just say NAACP. Who knows what their motto is? Anyone? Know? Okay, their motto is the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And what they were trying to teach young black people was, okay, don't buy the lie. Okay. Yep, music and sports may get you out of wherever you're at, but don't buy the lie. Build your brain up. Be smart. Be intelligent. Read books. Become an entrepreneur. Start a business. There's a great group here in Atlanta called the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. And what they do is they take teenage young black boys and mentor them. Teach them how to be men. Teach them how to, because uh, a lot of them didn't grow up with fathers and things like that. Teach them about their business and stuff. So they're training them up so they're going to be successful 
young men and then older men here in Atlanta and wherever they go and do that. That's mentoring and discipleship. That's a great thing, isn't it? That's why I love that. I think that's fantastic. Okay, so just because someone told me told you you can't do something, I don't believe those people. Because after my junior year in, in high school, I blew my knee out, toasted this knee. And all these people said, the, your college dreams are gone. It ain't going to happen. Okay, well, I worked hard, got back in shape, did okay my senior year, not great, but okay. But when I signed my name to a scholarship at Auburn University to play basketball there for four years, did I feel pretty good? Yeah, because my goals were achieved, but I also proved those naysayers wrong. And that's what I kind of enjoyed that as well. Okay, so if someone tells you you can't run your own business or you can't read 10 books in a year, something like that, okay, don't believe that. Okay, you decide to make a decision. Now, if you're not a big reader, eyes up here, please. Eyes up here. Eyes up here. Ladies, eyes up here. If you're not a big reader, you got to start somewhere. So the easiest way to do that is put a book by your bed at night. Read five pages before you go to sleep. Simple. Five becomes ten. Two weeks, you read a whole book. That's how easy it is. Okay. Matter of fact, when I speak at churches, uh, teens always come up and chat me. I'll point at kids. I say, "You're a homeschool kid, aren't you?" They'd be like, "Woo." They'd be like, "Woo." They think I'm gonna say something negative. Yes, sir, I am. How do you know? I said, well, two reasons. One, homeschool kids are very, very good with people of other ages because they hang out with parents and aunties and different. So they're very good people of other ages. You see that immediately. Okay. Second thing is most homeschool kids are big readers. Okay. So when you talk with them, they always seem much more mature for their age when I finally ask what their age is like. And you're thinking, no, they can't be that. Because typically they have longer sentences when they speak and bigger words. Why are we laughing? Amari, why are you laughing? Is that true? Do you notice the same thing? Okay. Yeah, because for some of us, you're being trained up. Everything is LOL or HMU and all this stuff, right? Yeah, they're, they're kind of dumbing you down. It's, it's a slow process, but that's what they're doing. I met a kid, little, little tiny kid. Oh, my goodness, was he small. And uh, he came up to me in Texas. He was like 12, but he was the size of like a six-year-old. He was just a little tiny kid. He hadn't had puberty yet. He's probably going to be a giant. Who knows? And uh, I'm talking with this kid, big words, big sentences. I said, stop, dude. I said, are you homeschooled? He said, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. He's a little tiny one. And uh, I said, you like to read? He said, so I've read 263 books. All Old English, like King James, he, Old English books, so big, strong words. His vocabulary was off the charts. His communication skills were crazy, and you just can see God is going to use this little tyke like nothing in the days ahead. Okay, So that's a choice you get to make. I put this in your notes. I always say this all the time. Either God is going to use you or Satan's going to use you. But you're going to get used. Either God is going to use you or Satan's going to use you. But you're going to get used. Either God's going to use you or Satan's going to use you, but you're going to get used. Okay. Give me an honest answer, okay? Have you ever had another human being use you before? Typically a good feeling or a bad feeling? Usually it's horrible because they took advantage of us, right? And nobody likes being taken advantage of, nobody, okay? So at the end of your life, you really want to make sure that God's done the using of you. Because Satan can use middle school and high school kids, can he not? Big time, big time, big time. But can God also use uh, high school kids, middle school kids, yes or no? I met a boy one day. Do you know what see you at the pole is? Okay, so at public schools, they do this thing, see you at the pole. So September 20th, all the kids, 100 kids get around, they see you at the pole. 
and they hold hands and they pray for the school, pray for the teachers, pray for God to move on their campus. They do it one day each year. It's called See You at the Pole. They do it around the country. I met this uh, senior uh, uh, somewhere I was traveling, and um, he told me, he said, Sir, he said, I'm doing See You at the Pole every single morning in my public school. I'm like, what? He said, every single morning. We get, I go out there, sometimes my friends join me, sometimes it's just me. And I put my hands around that flagpole, and I pray for my, student, uh, my kids in my class, I pray for my teachers, my campus. Sir, I'm doing it every single day of my senior year. Ooh, good or bad? That's awesome. See, he wants God to use him his senior year before he heads out there and graduates and moves on, okay? So your choice. So pray that, pray that. I pray it all the time. Hey, God, use me when I walk out the front door today. Use me. Okay, because someone's going to use me. I'd rather God use me than Satan use me. Make sense? Okay, grab your Bibles. Now, we're about to open up this book. So remember Sunday, I gave you two words about when we open up our Bible. What were the two words? Okay, it's dangerous. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Be what? Be careful. Okay, because it's a dangerous, dangerous book. If there's one book Satan doesn't want sitting by your bed you read each night, it would be this one. Okay? Now, when I say it's dangerous, I mean that it can change people's lives and impact people's lives. Okay? But for you, once you're a Christian and you're saved, don't forget this, okay? This is the most exciting book you'll ever put in front of your eyes. There's nothing like it. I got a list of verses I'm going to go through here, and 15 of them may not hit you. But the 16th one may just drill you, and that's what you came in here for today, just this one verse that will rock your little world. Okay, I told Daniel this. He's an actor on Amazon shows. He goes to this coffee shop I go to. And I told him, he's not a Christian. I told him, this is the only book you can read over and over and over again and keep getting things out of it every single time you open it. He was like, what? Because he reads a script and then just does the, whatever the acting is, right? He doesn't really, he, this is why this is a supernatural book, okay? So we're going to open it, so be what? Be careful, but expect God to drill you with something, okay? Never open up your Bible without the expectation of, of you getting drilled, okay? Because he wants, uh, it says in Isaiah that uh, he's the potter and we're the clay. Who, who? You're artistic. Do you do? Do you do you do uh, pottery? Come on, man. Who does pottery? Don't you do pottery? We used to do that in school. We in our art classes. You do pottery? I can do it on the public campus. With your grandma? All right. Explain how pottery works. Well, so, so we have to use clay, right? And then it's like this wheel that we spin it on. And it's a spinning wheel. Does anyone know the name of that thing? No. Okay, we'll go with spinning wheel. <laughs> so it's a spinning wheel. And we get some clay and we just spin it on. And the wheel starts spinning. And then we got to mold the clay into like some certain thing we want. Like it can be a baby. Right. Or anything. And then I don't. I okay, so, so you, the wheel spins and you're like making the vase, right? And if the vase looks ugly, I used to do this in second grade. We used to have a potter wheel at the school in New York, okay? If it, if, the, if it doesn't look right, what do you do? Well, what I would do, I would just try to remake the vase. Okay, so what were you going to say? Oh, you're playing with your drink? What would we do? Anyone know what you do? Uh, what? Okay, you wet your hands, you squish it back down, and it's round two, right? Now we go again, right? What you don't do is knock the clay off because it wasn't the clay's fault. It was my hand's fault. Now, the Bible actually says he's the potter and we're the clay. Boom. Uh, Simon, how old were you when you got saved? So, so when you became 15 and got saved, boom, he throws Simon's clay on the potter's wheel. And he's like, here we go. Okay? Start spinning, starts doing this, and you start stepping out and sharing your faith and doing that. Then you got baptized, right? You and EJ or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So then, bad. Oh, yeah, this is looking good. Okay. In the three years since then, you're 18, right? Uh, about to be 18. 
Okay, happy birthday. And um, so in the two years, 11 months since then, uh, have you messed up any or made some mistakes or anything? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. And when you did that, did get and just knocked your clay off. Did he do that? What's he do? He wets the hands up, crunches. Oh, we got to work that out a little bit. Because sometimes when you work clay, there can be a knot in there, like a little thing, right? So the vase can be looking good. There's a little knot on the side. And you got to get that out or it won't glaze correctly when you put it in a kiln. You put it in a kiln. You're like you heat it up with a kiln or something like that. So you are a work in progress. He's the potter. We're the clay. We're a work in progress. Does that make sense? So put on your, put on your notes, WIP, WIP, work in progress. Work in progress. <coughs> so, somebody raise a hand up and tell me what in progress means. So, raise a hand up. A couple more hands up. You were smart, folks. A couple more hands up. Y'all know. What does in progress mean? Um, okay, some guys said, okay, young lady, what does in progress mean? In the process, you have to finish the Oh, interesting. So you haven't completed it yet. Correct? It's not completely finished. Go ahead. Still going. Still going. So you're a work in progress, which means you never arrive. It's a lifelong journey of him being the potter and us being the what? Now, underneath that, write MIP, M-I-P. MIP. Okay. Now, do any of you young men, do any of you have sisters? Sisters, sisters? Christian, you got a sister? What's her name? Excuse me? I five. Five what? I mean, four sisters. There's four sisters and you? Yeah, four sisters. So there's six of y'all total? Yes. Did y'all like win the lottery and just like a bunch of kids showed up one day or what? That's awesome. Big families are cool, man. Those are fun, man. Three oh, three foster kids? Plus three. Plus three? What's six plus three? Nine. There's nine total kids? <laughs> hey, does anyone sleep at that house? That's got to be fun, man, and do that. Matter of fact, some friends of mine just had their 11th and 12th child. Nice. <laughs> 11th and 12th. Twins. Twins. Ready for this? Uh, they homeschool their kids. They birth at home. Okay. They raise the coolest kids, respectful, godly, witness, bold for Christ, not ashamed of the gospel. And I told the husband of one, I said, have all the kids you want. You're raising warriors for Christ. Have a, we, need, we don't need any more Christian kids. We need some warriors for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They're raising warriors. Have a, it, kids love each other. I mean, just the cool, one of the coolest families I've met in my life, okay? But they're doing it the right way. Now, some of us have seen family done the wrong way, right? Yeah. But yet you can change that, right, in the days ahead to do family the right way. Okay, so so uh, uh, you got a sister? Older, younger, what? She pretty cool? Okay. <laughs> Does she ever try to correct you? Okay. All right, we're on the same page here. Okay, so I'm speaking one day, Parkview High School, I think. I dogged your sister too? I enjoy you better. And um, <laughs> tell her I said hey, though, and do that. Um, so I'm speaking, I think it was Parkview High School. My sister came. She lives in Charlotte, Oregon. She's sitting in the back. And I, I did this whip, work in progress. So she came up to me afterwards. She said, Mark, she said, uh, you know, you use that whip thing. Um, you really need to change that. Now, why is my older sister trying to correct her younger brother after an amazing speaking event? But these are sisters, though. They do this stuff, right? So my sister, Jill, she said, you really probably need to change that. 
I said, okay, Jill, what should I change it to then, sis? Okay. It should be MIP, M-I-P. I said, for what? She said, masterpiece in progress. Oh, my goodness. Put that in your notes. Masterpiece in progress. I'm glad I listened to my sister at least once in my <laughs> lifetime, okay? <coughs> Young people, you're a work in progress, but you're also a what? You're a masterpiece in progress. You're a masterpiece in progress. And don't let anyone ever tell you any differently. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So if you're in the hands of the master, you have to be a masterpiece in progress. So if somebody, thank you, Sadiq. So if somebody is ripping you or dogging you and stuff like that, they don't understand you're a what? A masterpiece in progress. Young ladies, as, as the days progress and you decide to talk with and meet some of these young men, and they sometimes want to get a little bit handsy with you, and they're not treating you like a masterpiece in progress, tell them to hit the road and get away from you. You're way too special for that, and tell them so. You are too special to hang out with some chump change guy. I tell some teenage boys all the time, you act like a chump change boy. And what girl would ever want to go out with a chump change boy? Ain't got time for that. You're looking for a godly man, a warrior for Christ, that'll be your husband one day, be a great husband to you and a great father to your kids, correct? Take your time and be picky. Take your time and be picky. But young men, I also tell you, are you that rock-solid man of God that some lady's going to bring home one day and say, Hey, Mom and Dad, this is the one you've been praying for. And you told me to hey, get that rock-solid superman of God. Guess what? He's the one. I know it, Mom and Dad. Okay, so are you that, you're going to fit that bill one day? That they can be rest assured when they bring you home to Mom and Dad that, yep, this is the one? So you've got to work on yourself to do that, right? So we're masterpieces in what? So last thing before we open up the Bible, so I told someone just the other day, if we're in progress, that means enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. This isn't the destination. Where's the destination? In heaven with Jesus, God the Father, God the Son. So this is just the journey part. Enjoy the journey. Okay, enjoy it as you live for Christ. Because it's going to be wild on top of wild on the other side. Okay, it's going to be great. Okay? Make sense? All right, so grab your Bibles. Okay, be what? Be careful. Okay, here we go. Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Simon, what book in the Bible is that? First book. Genesis 1, verse 1. Okay, and we're, we're just going to go around the table. I'm going to bounce, bounce through a bunch of verses here and do this, okay? Now, you may want to write the reference down in your notes, the Genesis 1, 1. You may want to wait till some verse just hits you. But we're going to go through some things as we talk about discipleship, persecution a little bit, okay? So Genesis 1, 1. All right, young man, go for it. Nice and loud. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So I told, a, I told a, a guy searching out the other day, he's searching for truth. And I told him one thing. I did the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I said, just find out if that verse is true. If you can figure out that verse is true, the rest is easy after that. The rest is really simple. Okay. In the beginning, that's time. God. God was what? What? He was already there. So that means God wasn't what? He wasn't created. All right? In the beginning, God already created, made the heaven and the earth. So when someone... Um, tells you there was a big bang, okay, 
and these two little things hit each other, and it banged into a Earth revolving supposedly perfectly around a sun with a moon supposedly revolving around the Earth. We can tell you exactly when an eclipse is going to come by. April what? 8th? 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 You'll miss it on the 14th. And, um, you, uh, and everything is supposedly, uh, uh, we can go out and see the, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, all the dippers in the sky, right? All the little constellations, right? But wait a minute. Have you ever seen it? One time I asked a guy this one, have you ever seen one explosion that created more order rather than less order? You ever seen one? Never happens. A grenade goes off, less order. You seen the earthquake that hit Taiwan uh, yesterday or day before, man. There's some crazy videos and photos, crazy. One little shake of the ground, everything's tumbling over. Explosions create less order, so it can't be a big bang. I know how this whole thing got here. In the beginning, time, God, already there, created, made the heaven and the earth. And now you people who decide to go to school, well, you have to go to school, don't you? And um, uh, if you go public school route or college, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to go to college. Okay? I don't read about Paul's degrees in here and Peter. You don't have to go to college. The world tries to tell you you have to go to college. You don't. They're indoctrination centers. And all they're going to do for four years is destroy Genesis 1-1. They'll teach you everything how this one verse isn't true. They'll just say it in different ways. Okay? And by the way, um, if you are entrepreneurial and want to start a business, you don't need to go to college. You shouldn't go to college. I told my students, I used to teach school, uh, I told my students, learn your hands. Learn your hands. Every one of my students that learned their hands, heating and air, plumbing, or one boy lays tile in like nice people homes, everyone that learned their hands, not only did everyone have a well-paying job, okay, most of half of them now own their own businesses. Uh, two of my students, uh, they do gutter repair, like, you know what a gutter is? Yeah, they repair those things, and gutter repair, thank you. And uh, so one's in Columbus, Georgia, one's in Birmingham, the boy in Columbus, Georgia, goofiest, funniest kid, straight C student, straight C's. And I had to tell his mom, mom, academics is not Luke's thing. I'm just, I just told her. He was, he was a musical kid, he was just goofy, funny, studying for one of my tests is the last thing he would do, okay? I just told mom, he's wired different than all your other kids. One of the other kids is a medical doctor. I mean, that's how academic this family is, okay? Luke franchised one of these gutter things in, in Columbus, Georgia. His first year out grossed over a million dollars his first year out. This is goofy little kid with a guitar, man. But he found his stride a little bit later in life. He didn't need college. He found something he got excited about. He loves cutting deals now. He just, all of a sudden, it clicked for him, okay? So you don't need that if you don't have to go there, okay? All right, so now, what, now we're going to go to the last book of the Bible. What's the last book? So we started at the front. Now we're heading to the back. Revelation, and what's the last chapter in Revelation? So any book you ever read, the beginning's important and the what? The end's important. All right, so we're going to do uh, 16 through 21. All right, Revelation 22, 16 through 21. Young man, 16. Yes. I just have sent my angel to give you. This testament is testimony for judgment. I am the root and the offspring, offspring of David and the bright morning star. Okay, so he's saying he's coming from the line of David. Very important, you know your Old Testament because we can. I was talking well, we were talking to uh, about the, who's the real Jesus and do that. Okay, now watch what happens here. Okay, Mark seventeen. And the spirit and the spirit. God said, come and let him that hear it say, 
come and let them. That is Arthur's come and whosoever will let him take the water of life. So he's saying, "Come." Jesus is saying, "Come to me." We're all thirsty because sin can't satisfy you. The things the world can't satisfy you. You get done playing some sports. What do you want to drink right after that? You want some water, man. Get it back in your system, okay, and do that. Okay, let's see where this goes here, okay? Uh, next one, verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to the place described in this book. Okay, so we have here that God is talking about if anyone adds to the prophecy of this book. Now, since it's Revelation 22, we know this at least applies to what book? Revelation, okay, since it's the last one of that book. But more than likely, since it is the last words of the entire Bible, it probably applies to what? The whole shoot and match, okay? But he's saying, don't you add anything to this book. Or I have the plagues. Someone raise a hand up. What's a plague? Who knows what a plague is? Someone raise a hand up. <coughs> okay, that that could definitely be a curse that's going to come and do that. Okay, what you got? Uh, okay, so a lot of people associate with diseases and things like that. Okay, what you got? any type of crisis. Okay, so we we would put it down as any type of crisis and do that, right? Do we have any plagues in the Bible? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just mentioned that, and all of a sudden the hand what? Yeah, the when, when Moses was trying to was trying to free the people from Egypt. Very good. And someone name one of those plagues. <laughs> okay, hands down. Someone name me the twelve disciples. Okay, no, I wanted to see if there were more hands up for the twelve disciples, more hands up for the plagues. It was trying to see what we're interested in here. Okay, all right, hands down. All right. Uh, what was one of the plagues? Uh, the, like, the dead oh, the firstborn son was dead. Now, interestingly, if you go to college, and I recommend that you what? Don't. They will teach you that there was a disease that came by and killed all the babies at the time. And that's how you explain that plague. All right, use your brain power that God gave you. What's completely wrong with that assessment? There's something very wrong with that. Think it through for a second. What's that? Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. And, uh, okay, raise your hands up again. What, how is that E? What's wrong with that is ex explanation for that? What is it? Oh, wrong with that explanation is because what the scientists in said that the kids, the babies were dying at that time, but um, it wasn't just to say, it was specific kids who were dying. Okay, so, oh, that's very good. Okay, so it wasn't all the kids that died, it was the first born, but there's still something else that should jump at us. What? Um, it wasn't just kids. Because the first born, uh, Simon, you got brothers, right? Okay, so so if um, if a plague came through and it killed all the firstborn, would would you say goodbye, Chris? Goodbye, Stephen. You say goodbye, Stephen. And how old is Stephen? One six. Is that old now? Wow. And um, so that it's the firstborn. It wasn't kids, you see. But just by you knowing your scriptures, you can easily disprove that. Okay. Someone else, give me another one of the plagues. What's another one of the plagues? Yeah. Like frogs? What do you mean, like like frogs? <laughs> frogs would be appearing in people's houses, like everywhere. Frogs came up out of the rivers. Frogs were everywhere, and eventually the frogs died. And what happened? What happened? They smelled them. Ooh, stink, stink! They were all dead frogs everywhere, and they couldn't get rid of them. Okay, what's another play? Oh, we had the hail come through, right? And knocked all the crops and all that stuff. Anyone ever seen a, or been in a good hailstorm? 
Those are pretty cool. Put your car in the garage, though, if that comes through. Okay, one more uh, play. Oh, the water turned to blood. What'd you say? <laughs> so, so then he put his staff and hit the water in his blood. Now, here's something to think about. I wrote it in one of my books. Every one of the plagues was against one of the gods that the Egyptians believed in. What was the river that turned to blood? What's the name of it? The Nile River. Then the Nile River is like the Mississippi. And everyone came to this because that's where you put boats down, you put your crops down to send it to the next city. So they worship the Nile River. Great. I'll just turn it into blood. Okay. Uh, they worship certain animals. One of the animals they worship was the, well, yeah, but the, the frogs. You worship a frog, let me give you 27 million of them. And oh, then... Yeah, I, I, they worship the sun god. Okay. All right. So what was the name of the sun god? So R.A. Ra. So a lot of people worship the sun god. Okay. Um, we still worship the sun god in our society today. Do you know what spring break is? Okay. Uh, do you know what a beach is? Okay, do you know what a, uh, like a lawn chair is? Okay, so watch human beings put their lawn chair on a beach and they end up, what? They end up taking the lawn chair, thank you, and they end up turning it and sliding it. Because why? They're moving it to the sun to get the perfect tan. Okay, so they're actually showing I'm worshiping the sun god. Yeah, it's just so easy to figure this out, right? So he actually was showing you, you have these ten gods, but the god of the Bible is the god. Okay, so, that's part, so we don't want any plagues in our life, correct? No, okay, next verse, uh, that was 18, go to 19. Who's next? 19. And if anyone takes away from you the works of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Okay, so you don't add to this book, you don't what? Take away. take away from it. He's trying to tell you, handle this book very carefully. Our world is loaded with false teachings right now. Loaded. Okay? I pray all the time, God, if there's any false teaching in any of my books, let people read right over it like it didn't even exist. I pray it all the time. Because I'm human. I can mess up when it comes to this. But I don't want to mess up. Same thing when I speak. I pray, God, if there was a mistake in that talk anywhere, let them zoom over it like it didn't even exist and move on. Okay? Because truth is way too important. Okay, so let's start over here. Amari, right, go to, uh, that was 19. Go to 20. He who testifies to these things says, Okay, so he's coming quickly. And then 21, uh, Simon. Okay, so we don't add to or take away from this book. So if you don't want to make a mistake with this book, it means every single one of us needs to know this book better, correct? Young people, correct? I got to know this book better. I got to, got to, got to. If he's going to use me like I want him to use me in the days to come, okay? All right, go to uh, the book of Psalms. Now, how? what's the easiest way to find the book of Psalms? Open up your Bible right in the middle. Now, I'm doing a, I'm doing a Bible study for a guy who's never opened up the Bible before, okay? And so I was telling him, That if you if you don't know how to find something in the Bible, you just ask the person next to you. Most Bibles in the front have a what? Table, Table of contents. Okay, okay, and do that. But anything, anything you're good at, you what? You practice. 
So you can find things in the Bible just by you flip around and eventually you'll get there and do it, okay? So you practice. I'm at a church one time here in Stone Mountain and I'm sitting in the seat, the lady in front of me, the pastor is five minutes into his sermon and the lady in front of me is still flipping pages. He's five minutes into it, okay? And I don't think it bothered her, uh, her at all, cause I, it may, but it may have been her first time in the Bible. You don't know. So I just leaned forward. I said, ma'am, you're really close, okay? Just keep going a little bit farther, a couple more pages, boom, boom, okay, right there. And he's in verse, whatever. Okay, so you just help somebody out. You walk them to where you want them to go and do that, okay? So go to the book of Psalms, and I'm going to go to 119. 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's not only long, it's loaded. 119 is off the chain, I'm telling you. That that so 119 Psalm 119 verse 89. Okay. Young lady, next up for us. So 119 verse 89. Yes. So, thy word is settled where? In heaven. So God has settled his word. You don't add to this word. You don't take away from this word. It's all settled right there in heaven. Okay? Back up to Psalm 12. Go to Psalm 12. Christian, you got a Bible? Okay. Go to Psalm 12. So back up just a little bit. Get there saying that. Yeah. Psalm 12. So that's how you do it? You go down and just say amen when you get there? That's how you do it. Oh, really? Okay. And um, that's good. I like that. All right, Psalm 12. Christian, you there? Go to Psalm 12, and let's, we're going to do two verses. Verse 6. So Psalm 12, verse 6. Yes, sir. And the words of, of the Lord and flawless like silver, purified and a crucible like gold, refined, refined seven times. Okay, what's that translation you got there? Uh, and I just, okay, uh, who's got a uh, King James? I'm got a King James. Go ahead, so read that for us. The words of the Lord are pure words and truly refined the purpose of earth. So you're looking for pure. Pure is a great word, okay? Um, you ever seen like a silver coin that's 99% pure? That means they got all the impurities out of it. Okay, and the way you do that with gold or silver is you take the silver and you do what to it? What? what? You heat it. You get it hot. And as it gets hot, what rises to the top? Impurity. Impurity. So you take a little scoop and get really pure. Then you turn it hotter. And, you, and what's going to come to the top? More impurities. That's okay. You scoop it again until, until you can get 99% pure gold, pure silver, right? So he's saying you've got the pure words of God. It's right here in our hands, okay? Chris, verse 7. All right. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. So... Can God write a book and put a book together? Yes. Can God preserve it so we have his words in 2024? If he can't, he's not worth following. Because then you wouldn't know what truth is. All right? So I know in my hands here I have what is, and it's preserved uh, to this day, to this generation. That's why the importance of knowing the word of God and then giving that word to other people. I was dri driving home, and I stopped at a gas station on the South Carolina, Augusta, Georgia border. I pull in there. You ever seen anybody, like, selling, uh, like, uh, watermelons or cantaloupes and things like that at a gas station? You ever seen that before? No? So if you go to more country areas, someone will sell their stuff right there. They'll have a truck and sell it. 
So I saw this older guy up there, and he was always says, so I went, hey, how you doing, man? What's your name? Da, 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 da. And I said, so you're selling this? He said, yeah. I said, how much for this, that? And I said, hey, can I ask you a question? So I said, are you blind? He said, yes, I am blind. I said, so if I buy the $10 watermelon but give you $5 for it, you're not going to know the difference, are you? He wouldn't know the difference, would he? Because this is going to feel the same. It just feels like money. He can't feel the numbers. Okay. Which means somebody could take advantage of him. Correct? True? Okay. We kept talking. Witnessing to him. This dude loved Jesus, man. Loved Jesus. Quoting scripture at me. Quoting more scripture at me. Quoting more scripture at me. I was like, oh man, stop. I said, how do you know the Bible so well? He can't see. What did you tell me? Where did you hear it from? No, not an audio Bible? Okay, what people though? No. Family. Older man. Which people in his family? He actually told me the kids. He said the young, the young people would read him the Bible and he'd memorize the verses. Okay? And this dude could quote scripture just sitting on the back of a pickup truck. But I actually think he was also at the same time mentoring and discipling the younger people in his family. Because he was making them what? Read the Bible to him. I think, it, I, actually I think that's what he was doing. And through the whole process, he knew the word. And so did his young sons and boys growing up knew the word too. I, I'll never forget that guy sitting at that gas station. Man. Impressed the daylights out of me. But that's how you raise a family up. That's how you get the word into you, okay? He's preserving it even if, well, what Psalms say? I think it's in my notes, but we'll skip it. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 what? Who knows? 11? Huh? I think it's 105. Oh, 105? Yeah. It's in the beginning. Of it. 11. It is 11? Okay, go to Psalm 119.11. So we want to know those ways and do that. Wait, which verse? Which verse? 11. 11. 119.11. Yeah, I have Yeah. Alright, so go to 119. 119 verse 11. Okay, so who, uh, Amherst, you get that for us? Uh, Psalm 119.11. Your word I have put it in my heart that I might not sin against you. So if you ever get put in a place where you don't have the physical word in front of you, you should have the what? Word of God in you, okay, that you can pull it out when you need it. Because when you're on the streets witnessing, you may not be able to reach in your backpack and pull out your Bible to throw down. You need to know the verses and give it to them to help them out as they're searching. Okay, I, I've done uh, prison ministry through the years, and um, some prisons don't have uh, Bibles. Okay. The volunteers that brought stuff in, most of them could not go back in during COVID. The lady got a hold of me this year. She finally got back into the prison she was working at three years later. She was a volunteer chaplain. Many prisons have said, well, it, we didn't need it for three years. Nothing ever changed, so we're just going to keep it the same with no chaplains. We're having a huge problem in prisons. Because not all chaplains are evangelical. 
there's Roman Catholic chaplains and there's Muslim chaplains. And we send the material to the chaplains and many of them take the evangelical material and do what? Throw it in the trash can. We're in a fight. It's a fight, fight, fight. Okay. But God can work around that and get things done. We can tell you some really cool stories of that too. Okay. So hide it in your heart. So you know. So if you're going to be the disciple, you got to hide it in your heart to do that. Um, what time does your phone say? Four, four, three. Four what? Four, three. Okay, let me skip a couple things. And um, let's go to, uh, okay, let's do this one first. Second Timothy 2. So Second Timothy. <clears throat> New Testament. Second Timothy. That's right. If you don't know where it's at, you just look at the table of contents and do it. Second Timothy typically in most Bibles is right after what? First Timothy. Doesn't change. Hopefully not, or we got trouble, don't we? We actually just went over this chapter. Oh, did you? I didn't think it was going to a lot. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> Second Timothy two and verse fifteen. Okay. Next one up. Yeah, that's okay. You're up. Second Timothy two verse fifteen. What, what, what is that? What is that Bible? It's NIV again. Amari. Yep. Study to show thyself a food unto God, a workman that you have not to be ashamed, rightly divided. So he's telling you to study. Study means give effort towards. you got to have to work. Just like I was trying to outwork everybody else in the game of basketball, you got to put work into knowing the Bible. It takes time to do that. Okay? Study to show yourself approved under, uh, unto Mr. David. Study to show yourself approved unto your parents. Study to show yourself approved unto who? Why? When it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, he's who you answer to. I used to tell my students on Judgment Day, your parents aren't going to be there, your grandmama's not going to be there, your granddaddy, Mr. Kale's not going to be there. You and God, one on one, get ready for the get ready for the moment. And always remember, on Judgment Day, God wants Judgment Day to go great for you. A lot of bosses in the working world don't want your yearly review, review to go great. They actually don't want it to go great. Why? If it goes great, you're going to have to be promoted and given a raise, and they'd rather save the money. God's the opposite. He wants to tell each one of you, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you went for it. You gave it your best effort. And tuck this away in your head. When you get to heaven one day, some of the most famous people you ever met in heaven, you'll never have heard their names down here. Never heard their names once down here. Sometimes people with the big old ministry, with the big old money and the big old this, aren't half as faithful as that grandmother on the street, witnessing the kids, taking kids in and stuff like that. Not even close, by the way. Okay, so you, you do this to please the Lord. That's exactly right. Okay, needeth not be ashamed. You don't want to be ashamed. But what's he saying? How could you be ashamed? Because you didn't rightly divide the word of truth. You didn't handle the book correctly. You don't want to mishandle this book. That's, a, that's why if you ever watch me speak, anytime I speak, I'm actually very simple. I use a scripture verse and a story. Scripture verse and a story. That's basically how I talk. 
okay? Because I know once you start trying to rip and roar and dig deep in a certain area, you think you have the special revelation from God. Someone told me that a special revelation for God for me. I said, hold up. Do you even know these revelations yet? I want you to know these revelations first before you have a special revelation for me. One lady came up and was speaking at God told me to tell you. I said, stop. I said, stop. I said, why didn't God just tell me? Wouldn't that save him a little bit of effort? I said, okay, you can tell me what you want to, but whatever you say, I'm going to filter back through the word of God to see if it's biblical or not. Okay, tell me what you want to tell me. See, that's how they wrap things. They want to tell you this. God told me, no, no, you telling yourself to tell me is what it is, okay? I'm always careful of that like that, okay? I have to rightly handle this book, okay? Study to show yourself approved unto who? God, okay? That's who you're going to please with your life and do that. Okay, let's talk about persecution for a second, and then we'll do some uh, Q&A time here. So go to um, John chapter 18. John 18, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay, stop for a second. Don't move your Bibles for a second. Stop your hands. Uh, Chris, I was at your uh, place uh, after church, wasn't I? Okay, and you were bragging on somebody about um, how much uh, they study uh, the Bible, they're studying books, but they're actually super, super busy at the same time, too. Who is that person you were talking about? You brag on so many people, you forget who you brag on? What's going on here? What? Okay, it, it was your brother. It was your brother. Uh, so you, that's okay. You you bragged on her too, by the way. Um, so your brother's in what kind of school? If you ever do law school, one of my students went to Georgetown and he called me up from Georgetown Law School. He said, Mr. Kale, all I do is eat, sleep, and read, nothing else. He's reading 300 pages a day. A day for the law school he was at, Georgetown Law, okay? Mr. All I do is eat, sleep, and read, nothing else. Okay, for the first year. It's crazy. But then you, what did you say about Stephen, though? Same thing. Right? And, and, always and, but then he also had time for what? Reading the Word. Reading the Word he talked about. So Stephen never put that to the side. Right. Okay, so he was studying hard. He had to put the effort in to show himself approved unto who? God. Okay. Give good effort towards anything you do for the Lord, okay? John 18. John 18, and go to uh, verses 18 and 19. So John 18, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And 18... 18 and 19. Okay, go for it, sir. Whoa, whoa, back up, back up. A little louder, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. That's okay, no worries. Now the servants and officers have made a charge of power because he was sick, and they were standing and running his stuff. Peter was also with him, standing and running his stuff. Okay, hang on. Okay, so. Uh, is with the officers. They got the fire coals. This is at the at the end. They've arrested Jesus. Okay, Peter stood with them. And verse nineteen. Next one. The high priest then questioned Jesus about the disciples and his teaching. Okay, he's he's being questioned here because. Um, Go back to 70. Then say of the damsel kept the door unto Peter, are not there also one of the man's disciples? He said, I am not. Because he knows if he says he is, what's going to happen? He'll be killed. He'll be arrested. He's going to be mocked somehow. And many times when it comes to, I call it, push comes to shove. Push comes to shove. What are you going to do? Um, I was speaking at the University of Florida, and this kid told me he was in a he was in a, a biology class, three hundred students, and the teacher um, uh, said that we know how life got here to planet Earth. 
Well, that's great. We all want to know that. He said a asteroid uh, came out of the sky. It hit the Earth and brought a, an amoeba, a microbe, or a cell. And then that cell hit some water, began to evolve, and and that's how we got here. We all evolved from this thing that came from outer space that hit there and do that. And so this college kid was telling me this after a speaking event I was doing, and he said, I looked at my friend, he said, did he just say we came from aliens? That, you know, it came from outer space and down here. So I asked a young man, I said, when you knew he was saying something unbiblical, why didn't you what? <laughs> You're 300, 300 kids in a classroom. What do you need to do? But as soon as you raise that hand, you know trouble can come, can't you? Right? Trouble can come at that moment. You can get mocked. You can get ridiculed. Okay? That's what was going to happen to Peter. And Peter, what? He denied him. So sometimes God's going to move you into a put up or shut up position and you're going to have to make a decision. Now, if you decide to shut up, can God forgive you of that? Yes. There's times I've been a wimp. And I've said, God, please forgive me for being a wimp. Let me be bold the next encounter I've got. Okay. It happens. Don't worry about it. I'm in a, a class. Uh, who knows what anthropology is? What's anthropology? The what? <laughs> yeah, it's anthro something uh, for, for insects, but it's a study of man. Okay, so they study history, they study uh, cultures, and I, and I took an anthropology class. And the one thing they're going to teach you in an anthropology class, you can be 100% sure you're going to get taught what? Evolution. Evolution, 100%. Okay, so I was this, this tall, little, handsome college kid. I am sitting on the back row so I don't block anyone's view of the professor. <laughs> I'm back there, first day of class. And the teacher says something about evolution. And this other boy on the back row raises his hand up. And he said something about the Bible to the professor. And the professor, professor don't you bring the Bible into this discussion? <laughs> Boy wasn't done yet. He went back. I am sitting over here, and this is awesome. I, 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 man, this is entertainment, man. And they went back and forth for 10 minutes. Fascinating. Two things I remember. One, I remember nothing that teacher taught me four decades ago. That was 40 years ago. But I remember there was a young man bold enough for his God willing to raise his hand up and get mocked in the classroom. No clue what his name is, nothing. I don't. For, I haven't forgotten him, though. Two, I, in my opinion, he didn't defend it very well. But maybe he did. I wasn't a Christian at the time. So, you know, maybe he did a really good job. I just wasn't sure. But it's not easy when you're going against it, Dr. So-and-so, right? But he stood up for that. And man, I tell you, I never forgot that young man all these years later. Because that's the boldness. We don't want to deny when we get a chance to stand up for your God and Jesus Christ. There might be a kid eight seats away sitting there watching this whole thing. Who one day might get saved and remember the boldness of that kid. And then hopefully God will make this man bold like that one day too. Amen. Iron sharpens and we rub off on each other and do that, okay? Go to uh, 2 Timothy, okay? 2 Timothy. Find that boy. What's up? Find that what? Oh, well, I need to find him? Okay, so go to 2 Timothy 3 and I'll tell you a quick story. 2 Timothy 3. Whoa, why'd y'all laugh? What? Why'd you laugh? Did I say something? No, I'm just saying that. You'd be so happy that you made an impact on Okay, so um, go to 2 Timothy 3. Are you there? Yes. Typically you say amen, but no one says amen anymore. Uh, just say three. Just say chapter three at the moment. Okay, so uh, everyone there, Second Timothy 3? Okay, Sadiq, so I was, uh, 
when I was in college 40 years ago, whoo, that's a long time, um, four young men witnessed to me, okay? Um, Bishop Reeves, football player, uh, offensive lineman, John Gibbons, football player, offensive lineman, they came in my dorm room, sat on my bed, and shared Christ with me, okay? They gave me some literature, they walked out, and I said to myself, you know, that took some guts to walk into my room and share that. But if it's important enough for them to share it, maybe it's important enough for me to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so remember that. Um, uh, one year at school, uh, uh, I roomed with a manager, okay, on the basketball team, okay? Now, when you're an athlete, typically you don't want to room with a manager. Because why? Uh, Say that? Well, anybody can kick off the team for doing something bad, but what? So, as a player, most players border on being overconfident, or the other word, the C word, they're cocky. Okay, and managers are less than you. Okay, you just go through this as athletes. They weren't good enough to be on the real team, so they're managers now. Okay, now is that true biblically? No, everyone's made in the image of God. Everybody's valuable. You couldn't do half what you do without managers. How dumb can you be sometimes? But we can be dumb at times. Okay, so you always want to room with uh, a teammate. But there was a semi-problem. Okay, I was the only what on the team? What? I was the only white guy on the team. And the, the coach did not want me to room with a black guy. Okay. And this is insane. I mean, I've hung out with black folk my whole life because of basketball and other issues, okay? School, everything, right? And he put me specifically with a, a, a white manager, okay? I, I was beside myself. I couldn't believe it. Even said something to my coach about it. But they made the room assignments for the whole year. Well, little did I know. Little manager, Kim Cardwell, loved Jesus, played Christian music, read the Bible every single day. Nine months I had to put up with that. <laughs> but I saw a faithful man of God. I'll never forget that to the day I die. Fourth person, Rob Smith, head of the FCA, witnessed me. I remember the four guys who witnessed to me 40 years later. I still remember the names. So one time I'm down at, uh, I'm down at um, Georgia Dome, hand and tracks, the people walking into an event. And this guy walks up to me and he looks at me and he said, I said, wait, I know you. He said, yeah, my name is John Gibbons. He was one of the four people that witnessed to me uh, in college. I ran into him 25 years later. I said, John, do you know what happened to me? He said, no, what happened to you? He didn't even know I'd become a Christian, yeah. let alone speaking in places, witnessing, writing, and things like that. Okay. Uh, Sadiq, when I got home that day, I found his address in Montgomery, Alabama. I wrote him a three-page letter thanking him for the boldness to share with Christ with me and everything I did. And I wrote him that, and, and, and he didn't respond to it. He, he wasn't excited about it as I was. Maybe, I don't know, maybe his personality never went. I don't care. That guy was faithful and came up to me. I'm doing a retreat, kind of a D-Now type retreat for this church from Auburn where I went. This girl walks up to me. She's a senior in high school. Uh, sir, uh, my daddy wanted me to tell you hello. I said, great. I said, who's your daddy? She said, my daddy is Bishop Reeves. So one of the other four guys, his daughter was a senior at the retreat I did. And she wanted to go. I said, can you do me a favor when you go home? Okay. And I just gushed about her dad to her and tell that and give him a big hug. Tell him it's from Mr. Cahill. Tell him thank you for sharing Christ with me back at Auburn. Okay. Um, so, so we get to run into some of these people down the road, right? Um, but if you get a chance to encourage them and do that. See, I don't know if they're bold today, but maybe if they hear that one conversation actually got used in someone's life, maybe that'll get them to keep on keeping on and finish the race well. Because some are bold at one section. I've had pastors tell me that. I went to a church in Houston to preach and preach Sunday morning, did a two-hour training seminar on witnessing afterwards. Pastor came up to me. He said, Hey, Mark, I said, well, I said, forget the congregation. He said, I needed this. I used to do what you did. Then I became a pastor. I turned into a CEO over some church. 
I've lost my zeal. Mm -hmm. I've lost my, my passion. Mm -hmm. No way. I got to get back to doing what I used to do. Okay, so that's part of the thing is we want to finish the race what? Well and do that. Okay, 2 Timothy 3. Let's start at verse um, 11. Okay, you can start at verse 11. Yeah, so 2 Timothy 3. These are some good verses here. Make sure you know these. 11. Okay, so go ahead. 11. My first teaching is something that happened to me at Antioch, at Nicolia, and at Lusia, which persecution them, yet from them all the world rescued. Okay, so who's writing here, young people? Paul. Okay, Paul's writing here. He uses the word persecutions twice in the same sentence, in the same verse, okay? And the last part was, and out of all of them, what? The Lord delivered him. Okay? So he can't deliver you from persecution unless you get into what? Persecution. Yeah. So don't. So if you get into it, it's time to send a nice prayer up to heaven. Okay? I have encounters with police officers on the street sometimes, so sometimes I send a nice quick prayer up and get me out of this. Okay? And then you see what happens. Now watch verse 12. Very powerful verse. Verse 12. Okay. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, so those who just will live a godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, or shall suffer persecution. So God's telling you, that's kind of what uh, Mr. David was talking about at the beginning, okay? So once you decide to say no to sin and yes to God, Paul is telling you, great decision, but something's going to happen in your life. What's going to happen? Shall suffer. Per it goes with the territory. So sometimes I do this with my friends. I'll ask them the question, how is the persecution going in your life? And most people say what? No, no persecution, man. Everything's smooth, easy going. Life is good. Now, that's one of two things. Either God has given you a, a, a season of peace on all sides, like he did to uh, Solomon, gave him peace on all sides, or you're not living what? Godly for Christ Jesus, and why would Satan waste a, a one devil on you uh, to persecute you? Okay? You would want to live a life where persecution became part of your life. Okay? Be because you want the arch enemy of God to stop you from what you're doing for the King of Kings, correct? Yes. Right. So th it will take persecution to do that. But are you living a godly life in Christ Jesus where that persecution is going to come? That's a great verse for you to know, 2 Timothy 3.12. Okay? And then 13. Back to you. got your Bible? You got your Bible? No? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, verse 13. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's going to be deception. Uh, who's known as the great deceiver? Satan. Satan's the great deceiver. Okay. So deception's out there everywhere. But if there's a lie, there has to be what? Truth. Truth. Right? Yeah. So, so, so that's what you ask God to help you spot the deception and do that. Okay. 14. Okay, so you're are you learning on this disciple now? You're learning some things? Okay, you, you some of you seem pretty good in the scriptures, like like you know where things are at and things like that in certain verses. This is a real good sign. I've done some and uh, I mean that's how bad it was. They didn't know nothing in the Bible, okay? But it seems like a lot of you have a pretty good foundation here, okay? Now the key is to build upon that, right? And it's the book of Acts. Who, what did they say? Who was it, Aquila and Priscilla? That they were mighty in the scriptures. They were mighty in the scriptures. That's one of the best compliments you could ever get in your life, that you're mighty in the scriptures and do that. Okay, and then, um, so that was 14. Uh, go to f uh, 15. Next one. And also, in teaching you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you've known the, the scriptures from a child. Uh, is it Elena, your daughter's name? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So 
uh, <clears throat> Elena, will she be learning the scriptures as from a child? As a ch my goodness, that girl! Woo, watch out, man! Grandparents, uncles, mom and dad. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the chances of that child doing something major for the Lord Jesus Christ is off the chain, right? Other people that invest in her, right? But but we 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 need. Remember, I told you Sunday when it says the Roman guard at the prison. Even though the word is singular guard, it wasn't a guard. It was how many? It's a minimum sixteen. It probably was sixteen. Okay. Um, so guard can mean a group. Okay, so as a group invests into her, we need a group of young kids coming up that are going to be solid like that and do that. All right, and then uh, 16 and 17. 16? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for darkness, for reproof, for corruption, for instruction, and righteousness. Okay, how much of scripture? Uh, All scripture. We need to know the whole book. There's nuggets of truth everywhere in there. And even if you start going through some of the genealogies and things like that, and you get a little bit stuck, or some of the Levitical laws and get a little bit stuck, okay, keep pressing through. You're going to run into a nice little nugget coming up and do that. Okay, then 17. That the man God may be with every good work. So you want to be complete, right, and equipped for what? Every good work. Okay, all right. Raise some hands up. Tell me some things that um, you, you're not going to get persecuted for. So I'm going to ask it in the opposite way. So tell me some things you're not going to get persecuted for. Well, what? I mean, the floor is open. The floor is open. It can be anything. I just want to hear where you all coming from. So tell me something that you're not going to get persecuted for. Okay. Okay, so if you become tolerant in our culture, that used to be a good word, it's not a good word anymore, um, but if you become tolerant to what people, or what we, what is sin, and you let it slide, you're not going to get persecuted, you're probably going to get a pat on the back. Okay, okay, interesting, very mm, interesting answer. Okay, hands up, what are certain things you, you can do now as teenagers and middle schoolers that you're not going to get persecuted for? Okay, so so Sam, so, I mean, you're saying so if if uh, I decide I dare not to be different. Okay, so you're like that boy at the University of Florida when he knew he should have said something to the professor, but decided to keep his hand down and not raise it up. That we we didn't come from aliens and stuff like that, right? So he just went with the the flow. Let's just keep it smooth. Let me get out of here. Get my grade and move on. Okay? Uh, one of my students called me from Stetson University. He's taking an English class. So he wrote a paper and he did it on the end times in a secular English class in college. Okay? So he gets, what's the, what's the first one called that you do? You write a paper. It's called uh, your first attempt at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he does the rough draft. Okay? He gets it back. And he's got a C plus at the top of it because he's a straight A student. So he calls me here in Atlanta and uh, he tells me what's going on. And he said, Mark, he said, I know she gave me the C plus because she doesn't like my content. And the content was about the Bible and the end times. I said, OK, Mark, you got two choices. OK, um, I said, you can give her the content you want to get your A. Okay, I said, or, I said, we can juice it up a bit and get it a little bit better, too. I said, what do you want to do? But Mark decide. He said, let's juice it up. So I gave him some things to put in there, some scriptures, some other cool things. Turns the paper in. His grade comes back as an. A minus. So this is what happened. She was trying to push the Christian boy, bully the Christian boy, to see if he would back up, if he would actually change the paper. 
Okay. And Mark wasn't going to do that. He's still a strong man of God to this day, early 40s. He wasn't going to do that. And then he ended up telling me by the end of the semester, the, the English professor there, a lesbian, feminist, okay, Mark became her favorite student. Mark used to go back in her office and chat with about the assignments and things like that, and then he would what? Witness to her. But he's such a nice kid, very strong basketball player, very strong, good, strong, type A male, but just a very nice guy. And he wasn't going to back down. And she respected that he wouldn't back down, but respected enough to say, I care where you're going to spend eternity, so I have to tell you this. Okay? And she ended, he ended up being the favorite student there to do that. Okay? So, um, I'm going to... So, so, so let me ask, let me change the question. Um, so Rayson has it, what are things you could do as teenagers to, to get persecuted for? I was trying to teach you something in a backwards way, but I'll change it. So raise your hand up, what are things you can be persecuted for as teenagers, as you live this teen life and head off into your 20s? What are some things? Okay, so what's a, what's a situation... Um, that you could be in as a teenager when it would be time to speak truth, you might get that persecution. What would what would it be? Right. Okay. So so the, this whole gender issue we, when we bring that up, y'all know what we're talking about. Okay. Um, I told two 24-year-olds in a sports bar Monday night. I was out eating somewhere. And we got in a wild discussion. I said, you two, you two are living in the... They went to Christian high school, Killian Hill Christian School. And, um, and I told them, you were growing up at the craziest time I've ever seen in your life. That they're actually telling you a boy can become a girl and a girl can become a boy. What an insane time to be alive. Okay. And um, I, this came up at a coffee shop the other day, and I told this young man, I said, don't ever do this. But I said, if you put on heels, a skirt, a lipstick, and a wig, okay, and I accidentally cut your arm off, and I checked your chromosomes, I said, what would your chromosomes be? He said, uh, sir, I'm not sure. And I said... He forgot which were the boys. What are the boys' chromosomes? Okay, so you don't know that one. No, no, it's the opposite. It's X Y for boys because we're different. Trust me, we're different. Okay, and you'll marry one of these different ones. All right, girls are what? X X. So, so, so no matter what you change, the chromosomes stay the same. In the beginning, God made them what? Male and female. But you know what? A lot of those kids that are struggling with confusion, they want to, they need to hear and want to hear what? The truth. They actually do. They actually do want to hear it. Okay? I'm at a church speaking in um, Ohio, and, and a, a group of us went out to... What you laughing at, man? Ohio is a long story. Okay. All right. Okay. Never go to that state, according to Simon. So I actually went to this state and um, preaching at a church, and a group of us went out to eat afterwards, and the guy sitting next to me uh, pulls his phone up, and he shows me a picture. And that picture is of him as a woman. And he said, this was me. I was like, seriously? And he showed me a few more pictures. I'm like, like what's going on here, okay? Well, he bought the lie that the world had taught him, and he went down the female route, okay? Then he got born again and saved and realized God may be male, and he's transitioning back to the male. So I asked the pastor about it later. He said, no, Mark, completely 100% biblical salvation. He's totally a born-again believer. But now he's having to undo the lies that happen, and physically they tear your body up in this stuff and do that, right? And some of that you can never get back again. Okay, so again, uh, again, so that's why you'll get persecuted if you do that, but 
even if you were that person on the back row saying that in a classroom, it doesn't mean there's not somebody else in the classroom listening at the same time. I always tell young people, when you put your hand up in a classroom, forget the professor. Forget them. That's who you're talking to, but forget them. You're probably actually talking to someone else in the classroom, and you just don't know it yet. Okay, hands up. What are, some, what are a couple of things you can be persecuted for? Okay, so if you're in a if you're in a, a chain of text messages or something, and someone brings up that topic or something else, right? And you know, I got the verse to put in here, and you know, as soon as you do, though, here it comes. You're about to get hammered. Okay, is Jesus worth it? That's what you have to decide. Is he worth that? Okay, what's something else you can get persecuted for? At your age, okay. So, well, okay. So, repentance definitely for believers, right? So, so if you have a, a buddy of yours that you, that's claimed salvation, you know they've made a biblical commitment, and if that's what they say, you have to go with it, okay? And you see them going in a in a wrong direction that you know there's a dead end down there. Isn't the loving thing, lovingly thing to do, to step in and say something to them? But you could lose a friendship over it, right? You, you could, but isn't their soul more important than the current time we're spending together? Okay, um, have any of you heard of uh, Charles Barkley, the basketball player? You heard of that guy? No? Okay. Well, we were on the same college team. I played on the same college team as him. And so we were, we were very close friends through the years and stuff like that. But then I got saved. And things began to change because I couldn't do all the same things we used to do together. And one time I was down at the TNT studios where they filmed the show there. And uh, they all went out afterwards. So I go out afterwards and we're sitting there. And I'm drinking orange juice because I don't drink anymore, okay? But I did as a lost guy. And some girl across the table says, hey, what are you drinking? And Charles Barkley puts his paw on the table and says, leave him alone. He's drinking orange juice. He doesn't drink like we do. Leave him alone, okay? And bingo, that was it, right? And all of a sudden, the girl came over. Excuse me, why don't you drink? I want to know right now, why don't you drink? Okay, I said, well, I'm a Christian. And, and I said, I don't need alcohol to have a good time. I said, um, you can't get drunk unless you what? Drink. Okay, that was simple. The Bible talks about drunkenness left, right, and center, Okay. And trust me, if you're drinking, uh, you're not praying, you're not reading your Bible, you're not witnessing, you're doing none of that God stuff, right? We're talking bingo. Then we start talking about Jesus Christ. This girl and I talked for like an hour in the middle of this club, okay? She looked at me at the end and said, I'm going to call my mother tomorrow and tell her I had the best conversation in my entire life about Jesus Christ in the middle of a bar. That's what she said, okay? Light shines in darkness. I don't have to do what the world does. Okay, but you can't hang out with that all the time either, especially at your age. Okay, it's very easy to start the compromise. A little step here, a little step there. I used to tell my students, you may not drink beer, but if you keep going Friday night keg parties, we call them keg parties back in the day, you'll eventually pick up a red Solo cup and you'll be drinking beer one day. Who you hang with is who you become. Okay? Uh, Corinthians, bad company corrupts good character. Be careful who you hang with. One of the best things you can ever do in your life is get rid of certain friends in your life. You heard of toxic friendships, toxic relationships? Yeah. Either people are pulling you to God or they're pulling you away from God. There's no middle ground here with friends. They're pulling you one direction or the other. So in my life, the only inner circle people I've got are born-again believers in Jesus Christ that share their faith. That's the only inner circle people I've got. A little bit outer circle will be believers, but if they're not bold for Christ, I can't have you too close to me, okay? And then outside of that are acquaintances, friends that maybe are lost and things like that. So I keep them in the orbit, but I can't have them the closest to me or they could be impacting in, in, in my life. Does that make sense? So be careful who gets in your inner circle and do that, okay? So the other thing I used to tell my students all the time is um, you're going to get maybe – maybe 10 to 15 outside chance, 20 close friends in your lifetime. That's it. You're never going to have 100 close friends in your lifetime. It does not happen. Okay? 
half of those friends will come during the high school puberty years. There's just something about growing up with people that a couple of my buddies today are still buddies I had in high school. That you're just, you're just going through that, okay? Um, the best out of those 20 people and the closest out of those 20 people in the days to come will be your what? One day in the future will be your what? Well, yeah, yeah, but but the closest of all of those down the road is going to be who? You, whoever you marry. Yeah, whoever you marry. What? You're not thinking about marriage yet? Okay, take your time. And uh, so, yeah, because that should be your, uh, I had a, you know where North Lake Mall is? I had this guy at North Lake Mall, and I'm chatting with this, this, this lady, this guy, and th they had a baby. And I'm witnessing to him. Then all of a sudden, the lady brings up that, hey, my husband is getting too close to this lady at work. Okay? And, and mama ain't liking this. I looked at that man. I said, sir, there's two women and two women only that should be speaking into your life. I said, who are these two ladies? Who are they? Your wife and who? Your mom. And maybe a grandma too, but, but that's it. There shouldn't be no girl at work speaking into your life. Because that's how a little seed gets started and now everybody's in trouble. Okay? So part of what I meant is how do you not get persecuted is if you just fit in and do that. So I'm teaching at a camp where we took the kids on the streets witnessing. We walked out, walked the streets, started sharing Christ with people. Okay? A guy at the camp I didn't know this, but he decided he was also going to do something called servant evangelism, okay, where they were going to have kids go clean the streets up in Chattanooga, go pick up trash over at this big park and stuff. So you could sign up for servant evangelism, or you could sign up for regular evangelism like the Bible says, okay? Well, a bunch of kids signed up for servant evangelism, and what didn't happen to them during Oh, there was no persecution coming their direction. Hey, thanks for cleaning the streets. That's really nice of y'all. When we drive around and see people, a group of people cleaning the streets, typically, normally, who is it? No, it's not Christians. Who is it? What? It's prisoners. It's prisoners working off uh, some of their uh, community service hours and things like that, right? So we had a group of kids cleaning the street, getting no persecution. Next, you know, I walked down this one street, and these kids said, Mr. Kale, come here, come here, Mr. Kale. I was like, what? We just got kicked out of this bar. I was like, what are you teenagers doing in a bar? Okay, first of all, well, we went in there, the door was open, so we started witnessing to the bartender. And it was a really good conversation, and the manager kicked us out. <clears throat> I said, great. I said, would you come here and help us? I said, what do you need help for? Well, this is the bartender. The bartender left the bar, too, to come out with the teenagers because he wasn't done talking yet. Because he was listening to you all as you were standing up for God and Jesus Christ. The manager kicked everybody out, okay? And the teens are on the streets doing what the Lord calls us to do, right? Great, great, great story. little persecution turned into a great encounter. And do that. Okay? All right. Okay, so raise some hands up. What questions do you want to ask me about witnessing, the Bible, something I mentioned, persecution? Raise some hands up, and then we'll get ready to close this up. What time is it? Uh, okay. All right, so questions for Mr. Kale? Yes, ma'am. Um, what method do you use to share the gospel? How do you do that? What method do I use? So um, I, if you ever go to a Southern Baptist church, I was in one one time, they have something called Faith Program. They had uh, another one called Evangelism Explosion. I heard this preacher get up there. He said, you know what? We got all these programs to share our faith, but there's only one thing we don't do. What don't they do? Share their faith. You have a million programs, okay? I'd rather have two or three things in my arsenal and use that than a hundred weapons and never use it. So I had a waitress today, senior in high school, actually, uh, um, Maria, and uh, I, at the end I said, okay, three questions for you. She said, okay. First question. She said, I said, do you ever think about what happens when you die? Now, 99% of all people are going to say what? Yeah. What? Yeah. Who? I heard a lot of people say that. No, I just thought that. I've heard a lot of people say no, but a lot of people say yes. Do you ever think about what happens when you die? Do you ever think about what happens when you die? Yeah, well, most people say yes. Okay, that even if they say no, immediately deep down, I know they're what? 
I think they're lying. Right. I just think they're lying. Okay. So I just take it for that, right? Then I asked her, I said, okay, well, what makes you think about it? That's a great question. What makes you think about it? I had a waiter recently, and he told me, anytime a celebrity dies, I think about death and wonder what? If that was me, where would I go? Yeah, fascinating. Great talk with this waiter. She said, what are those people that are, like, infatuated with death? I was like, I don't know. What are you, what are you asking me for, okay? That's what she said to me. So I guess there's a group of people that think about death a lot. I guess there's a name for it. That's her. What do you think happens when you die? That's the third question. So do you ever think about it? Yeah. What makes you think about it? And what conclusion have you come to? And she kind of danced around a little bit, and then she finally got to a little, probably a heaven and hell. I said, okay. So then you just use this. If, and you, I point to myself, if I want to go to heaven, okay, what do I have to do? Okay, so you make them explain it. Don't always just give them the answer. Then they say yes. Okay, you learn this. Uh, 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 put in your notes, QE, 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 QE. Something I teach all the time in, in my books, but I teach it when I speak a lot. QE, QE. Chris, you know what that is? Yes, sir. Simon, you know what it is? Actually, well, what is it, Chris? Question everything, question everybody. So it means question everything, question everybody. QE, QE, question everything, question everybody. Okay, so I challenge people. I wrote this on a napkin the other day in a coffee shop and slid it across the table to this guy, Vincent. He's not sure there's a God. He's taking a world religions class. Oh, he's the guy I mentioned Sunday. But I put it in front of him, QE question, because if you start questioning things to find answers, you're going to find the truth. I'm telling okay? So you question everything, question everybody. So if I tell you that um, uh, uh, there's a thing called panspermia, which, which aliens seeded the planet, and we all evolved from aliens, and you're in a classroom, what do you need to do at that moment? When you're in a classroom, what do you need to do? Uh, in the book, One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven, there's a chapter called Four Deadly Questions. Four Deadly Questions. Very good ones to learn. One is, how do you know that to be true? Uh, so we all came from aliens to here, da da da. Excuse me, uh, professor. Always stand up, be polite. Uh, sir, how do you know that to be true? Sit back down. Do they know it to be true? No, it's just their opinion. That's all you want to get out there. How do you know it's true? Okay, good question. Uh, were you there? when it happened? It's a great question. Were you there when it happened? So ask the same question. Excuse me, sir. Uh, were you there when it happened? Sit back down. Okay. Because what did I say Sunday? One thing you look for in a court case is what? Eyewitness testimony, right? So he wasn't there. So all he's giving you is his, is his what? Opinion. Now I need to question that opinion, see if he's got any evidence to back it up, like we talked about Sunday. Okay, so that's why asking good questions, I, I'm walking on a plane flight, Chicago, three people in front of me, uh, they were all grad students at Northwestern, and Northwestern's a really top-notch school. So I'm asking some questions as we go on, asking a couple other questions, we're walking on down the little runway thing, asking a couple more questions, gave them a book, we're about to walk in the plane, two, two guys and a lady, the lady turn around, turns around and says, sir, I said, what? She said, you ask the best questions. See, the questions just narrow things down a little bit. We can get to the truth and do that, okay? So that's why you just ask the questions. And then when it comes to witnessing, practice, 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 okay? And do that, okay? Questions uh, on persecution, questions on witnessing, questions? Yeah. Yes, I gave you two of them. And, uh, but if, if I give you all four, then I can't sell your book. Uh, so I don't remember, actually. I don't know. Uh, they're really good questions, though. And uh, so it, it's a chapter called Four Deadly Questions and the One Thing You Can't Do With Heaven. I can't remember. And, uh, and I learned that at a conference I was at. Remember those and put those in my arsenal. I said, I can use these. These are great. Okay, and do that stuff. Okay. But how do you know that to be true is a, just a wonderful question. Because what you find is most people believe something. A matter of fact, um, 
Oprah Winfrey, y'all heard of Oprah. Oprah's way off into New Age stuff, okay? But her one of her favorite questions to ask a guest is, how do you know that to be true? One of her favorite questions to ask people and do that, okay? Um, okay, uh, question on persecution, I believe. Oh, so, like, you're supposed to look right? Yeah. What, like, what is society's Okay, good question. So, um, I, I have a, I have a, Amari, what's your GPA? How old are you? Uh, what was your high, What was your high school? Or your GPA? Your senior year high school? Oh, that's okay. No worries. What was your What was your What was your, So you So so you Wait. Okay. Wait. So your grades were so high you dropped out of school. Is that what it was? Oh, okay. COVID messed up everything. Oh, okay. You, you don't worry about it. And, and is God going to check your uh, high school GPA when you die? No. College GPA? No. How much money you got in a bank account? Uh, so so don't don't ever worry about that stuff, okay? Uh, you were homeschooled. Who's in public school? Who went to public school? What was your uh, GPA your senior year? <laughs> How old are you? You're a junior. So what's your GPA? 3.25. Where do you go to school? Oh, yeah, Charlotte. Okay. So, uh, well, no, no, no. My, no, my basketball coach coached in Shiloh after he coached me in Stone Mountain. That's all I was mean about it. Oh, it is? Uh, so, in, 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 uh, in college, in college, I had a 3.92 GPA in college. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had four Bs, four Bs, one, two, three, four. It was quarters, so you can make a lot of Bs and still have a good GPA. Four Bs. They were all in what, what subject? Science. English. English. I hate to write. hate every aspect of writing. Completely hate it. Hate it. I've written seven books. A, a guy said to me, a guy said to me, Mark, you need to write a book. I said, why? He said, you have way too much good teaching and way too many good stories. It'd make for a great book. I said, thank you very much. Put that on the back burner and went on with my life. 30 days later, a guy comes up to me. Hey, Mark. I said, what? He said, you need to write a book. I said, why do we need to write a book? He said, you have way too much good teaching, too many good stories, and a book can go places you can't go. Never, ever thought about that. So who likes music in here? <clears throat> Who's heard of the Beatles? Ooh. It's just old people stuff. Who's heard of John Lennon before? Okay. Who's heard of Mark David Chapman? Who is that? Oh, who is it? I heard the name. Well, isn't that wonderful? You just heard me say it. And, uh, so Mark David Chapman is the guy who sh who shot and killed John Lennon. He, he wrote me a letter one day. He was reading one of my books in a prison in New York. I got the return address. I knew exactly who it was. I'm reading the letter. And what is he wrestling with? Can God forgive me of pulling the trigger and killing John Lennon? What's the answer? Yes, he can. I, I explained to him back to him. Moses was a murderer, got right with God, called the most humble man that walked on planet Earth. King David, murderer, got right with God, called a man after God's own heart. Okay? So can God forgive that? Yes. I'm not going to that prison. But somehow the book got in that prison. Right? So someone challenged me, and I decided to try it. And got some neat feedback on it, and very glad I accepted the challenge. So, so, but I actually I, I write kind of simple. Uh, I preach kind of simple. I write simple. I used to be, I used to teach eighth and ninth graders. In eighth and ninth graders, you have to take big concepts, put them into smaller chunks, so people can understand them. So I have letters from sixth graders who read my books, and a few weeks ago, a hundred year old chick called me up. Hundred. She called me up. She's reading one of my books. Loved it. Can I get some more to give away? How much would they be? I said, ma'am, it's your lucky day. 
She said, why is it my lucky day? I said, because here at the ministry, we give free stuff to anybody 99 and a half and above. <laughs> it's your lucky day. She was so excited. So I sent her a bunch of free stuff to give away. Okay. All right, a couple more questions. We'll close it up. Questions on witnessing, persecution. Yep. What's your hardest time you've had witnessing? <clears throat> hardest time I've had witnessing. So, a couple things. One, don't judge a conversation by the length of the conversation. Because sometimes your shorter conversation will be your best ones. Um, because what you're presenting is truth, and they got to walk away and deal with it. So, so time doesn't do that. Uh, one of my buddies, Chris Galloway, they, they go out every Tuesday night downtown Atlanta. TNT, they call it. And he was witnessing down at the five points down there by Georgia State. And he was talking to um, this, just a, a radical homosexual guy, just radical. And Keith was, uh, uh, Chris was giving him truth. The guy just turned and walked away, walked up the street, turned and came back, talked some more with Chris, turned and walked away. What happened? Six different times. This guy walked away, and six different times he walked back. Okay, something was going on there. So your initial thought might have been, this is tough. It's not going well, but the guy just was processing what you do. So uh, good versus bad, hard, I, nothing just jumps out for some reason, I guess. I don't, um, a tough conversation doesn't bother me. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. I, it just nothing jumps out. I don't know. Uh, Chris, what's the hardest conversation you've had with us? Uh, I'd say any any time I talk to a family member. Oh, that's a good one. There might be family members watching this, so I'm not going to name which family member it was. Find them on Facebook and okay. tell them about it pretty quickly. But somebody very close to me who doesn't know the Lord, um, you know, for years he just on my heart to witness to this person. And just didn't really get the chance to, you know, my mom and dad to talk to him, but really God was putting on my heart to see him. And uh, I'd say the people <coughs> closest to me are usually the hardest. That's people. actually a good one. Family can be tough, family, yeah. Coworkers, right. um, family members, people who see me every day. I'm very comfortable talking to a total stranger. And you know, even if they have pretty radical beliefs, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to see this person, share the gospel, plant the seed. I'm not going to have to see them again. But <laughs> people who I see on a daily basis, especially family who know me personally, They'll see all your flaws. They'll see all, you know, where you mess up. And it's like, wow, you know, the, the witness is kind of, it's a little bit heavier. So sometimes we don't want to witness to a family or coworkers because they see us every day. Yeah. And when I mess up, okay. But wait a minute, shouldn't that be the advantage? Yeah. That they see you every day trying to live for Christ. And remember, lost people, I'm about sick and tired of that young lady. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? I'm in, uh, I'm in the state of Washington, and I'm speaking at a Sunday morning church, and um, it, they did it in the auditorium of a school, which is actually a great place to do church, because you don't have to build a building. You just rent it, and so they do it. So I'm in this, and it's a huge, three or 400 people, and there's a baby in there just wailing and wailing, Okay. And undoubtedly, Mama liked my talk because Mama wasn't going nowhere. And babies went to the point everyone is kind of looking at Mama and the baby. So I had to deal with it somehow. So I said, I said, do y'all hear that? <laughs> Everybody heard it. Do y'all hear that? I said, what a beautiful sound. Do y'all hear that? And, uh, and it wasn't a beautiful sound. Everyone was just irritated with it, right? I said, you know, I said, that mama there, she could have made a different choice nine months ago, a year ago. We would never heard that sound, meaning abortion, right? I said, isn't that a beautiful sound? All of a sudden, the people started nodding their heads like, that is a beautiful sound because we're getting to hear the child do that, right? And uh, do that. So, uh, wait, Chris just said, oh, family members. Um, can be hard co-workers. So remember, it's an advantage because they get to see you every day. But when you mess up, what do you do? You go to the person and say what? 
hey, you know, I've been witnessing to you. I'll tell you about Christ and stuff like that. And yet, just yesterday, I said something that should not have came out of my mouth. Okay? And let me tell you something. I've asked God to forgive me for that. I hope you'll forgive me so you'll keep listening to me. Okay? But I was not a good example of a Christian yesterday and do that. Okay? So that's being very what? The H word. Humble humility. It's okay to mess up. Because you're a whip. No, 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 no. no. Well, what? Oh, what's a myth? You're a masterpiece in progress. You're, you're enjoying the journey. You're not at the journey yet. The end of it and do that, okay? Um, last two things. Uh, aren't you going to Stone Mountain tomorrow? Okay, so uh, what happened in Atlanta in 1996? Do any young people know what happened in Atlanta? Oh, y'all know that? No. You knew that? You were like born. Your parents even married at that time. And um, so the Olympics were here. Well, Stone Mountain had uh, five of the Olympic events were at Stone Mountain Park. Yeah, and so uh, the, the cycle races and some of the kayaking was out there and stuff. Well, one of the law firms that I do some work with, they actually were bringing a lawsuit against Stone Mountain for this free speech rights. So you can be able to hand out tracts and talk with people and do that stuff. Well, I've had to use this law firm a couple of times when I've run into different issues and stuff like that. Well, I go out to the Yellow Daisy Festival uh, witnessing handing tracts to people walking in the Yellow Daisy Festival. So I've gotten to know Mr. Spicer, the head policeman. And he actually tells the other policemen who sometimes when they give me a little bit of a hard time, leave him alone, okay? He knows the law better than we do out here, okay? Because I just know my rights. And if you know your rights, you don't back up. Because if you back up, the person coming behind you may not be given the right to do what they're doing, okay? So um, I was at Yellow Daisy this year, and there's a new guy, sir, can you move over there to the side with your gospel tracks? Well, everyone's walking in here, and he wants me over there where even my long arms couldn't get to them a gospel track. I said, no, sir, I'm fine. I'm fine right No, I'd like you to move it. I said, no, I'm okay. I'm actually fine right here, and I just kept going. So that guy got, and I, and I heard him pick up his phone. He called the chief of police out there, and he said, okay, what's he doing? He's standing right there. And no, he's fine. Okay. And so he walked away and left me alone because I know my rights and do that. So last year, I'm at State Farm Arena. You ever go to State Farm Arena, the, the thing downtown? So I'm standing there handing tracks out, and, hey, did you get one of these? Really? Hey, did you get one of these? Hey, enjoy the game tonight. Just, just hand the tracks out. We'll, we'll get out 1,000 tracks at concerts, different things, just giving out tracks, right? So a lady working for State Farm, she said, it was a basketball, said, sir, can you move off of there and go over there? And I said, no, I'm okay. Thanks. And uh, on a public sidewalk, which is legal anywhere in America to have a public sidewalk, to stand there and preach, open air preach, hand out gospel tracts, whatever. That's what public sidewalks are for. Okay. Would you? No, I said, I'm okay. And I saw her go talk to a policewoman. I'm like, this is not going to go well. And um, a police lady comes over, says, sir, can you move uh, over there down the street? I said, no, I'm, I'm actually okay right here. And police lady says, no, no, I, I actually want you to move. I said, ma'am, I said, this is a public sidewalk. On every public sidewalk in America, you can hand out gospel tracts and hand out literature. Okay? And uh, sir, and I'm not budging and she's not budging. Okay? Uh, I, I said, you might want to go talk to the other police. So this other police lady comes over. And um, she said, okay, what's going on here? She was a very, very nice lady. And she said, this, this, and this. I said, it's public. Well, let's call. Let me get a, the head of State Farm and, and get him out here. I said, ma'am, I said, the head of State Farm, whoever this person is, does not determine what you can do on a sidewalk in America. They determine what State Farm is. State Farm guy comes out. So he's just handing out literature. He's just doing this stuff. Yeah, as long as he doesn't harass people, say, come in, da, 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 it's fine. He walks away. I said, ma'am, do you know I have the right to harass people on a public sidewalk? I have the right to yell and scream and call you all kinds of things on a public sidewalk. Now, you don't do that as Christians, right? But you actually have the right to yell at people on a public sidewalk. It's the First Amendment that we're losing drastically in our country. Okay? Another police lady walks over. Okay? They're trying to get me. I said, ma'am. I said, you were here last week when I was standing right here one week ago. You were the policewoman here. 
okay? And you didn't tell me to move and do that. Well, I just, I just didn't, you know, so, so I said, if it was okay a week ago, it's okay today. And then I said, ma'am, I've been standing at this spot for 28 years handing out Christian literature at the Omni Phillips Arena State Farm Arena. It's okay publicly for me to do this here. They finally said, okay, and they dispersed. Okay. I walk over towards where my backpack is with my tracks, and there's a guy sitting there. He looks at me and said, you knew you were correct, weren't you? I said, are you an undercover policeman? He said, yeah. I said, I've seen you around at different events. So I, I get to know some of the undercover because I recognize their faces. He said, you knew you were correct, weren't you? And I, and I did. But wait a minute. Shouldn't he have stepped in and said, ladies, okay, he's fine right here. No issues at all. Okay, da -da. But see, they got to protect their own blue, the other police, and do that, right? But we got to know our rights because there might be a guy coming next week that doesn't know all the rules. And if you stand today, it's easier for the people to stand coming up behind you. Okay, second to last thing, I was in Texas. We took a bunch of teens witnessing at, um, into a mall. Okay, and we're witnessing, and the police or the security guards, the mall cops, ooh, they were not happy. And uh, so this one guy comes, and he starts talking to me. I said, sir, we're just chatting with people, no big deal, like that. Uh, but malls are different. It's private property. And he says, sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want you to leave, okay, and do that. I said, okay. I said, so, I said, so he walks me to the door. So as he's walking me to the front of the mall for me to walk out, what do I do? What? I witnessed to him. He starts giving me every right answer about Jesus Christ. I said, sir, let me tell you something. Are you serious? You're going to throw out me and some teenagers that are standing up for Jesus Christ and you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ? Are you serious? His face turned bright red. Okay, I put him on the spot. Okay, he should just look the other way and go is what he should do. Okay. Um, I said, that's between you and God, but I'm telling you, you're making a mistake, man, doing that, okay? So he tossed me out. Well, I just went somewhere else to witness. And um, found out later from the teenagers when we came back to the church, the teens told me um, they, uh, the police guy came back in because we were in groups of like threes and fours. He stared at these groups, took his hat off, just shook his head and just walked away. He left all the teens alone. And they got to witness for the next couple hours in the mall and do that stuff. Yeah, so it was just sometimes you just make your stand and do that, okay? All right, last thing, we're talking persecution and do that. So I had lunch with these two ladies. They wrote a book, and they're with the same speaking agency I'm with. And they are in, uh, they, they were, uh, they live in Iran. Have you heard of Iran? Good evangelical Christian country? What? Brown. What? Good Iran. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the most radical Muslim countries in there, okay? So we're having lunch at, over in Decatur, and I asked the ladies, I said, uh, so so you got, like, arrested for your faith. Okay, now do we have anyone in the Bible arrested for their faith? Yeah, we got Paul writing books from prison. So if you want to become a good author, get arrested, and just start writing books from prison like Philippians and stuff, right? Okay, um, you arrested for your faith. They said, yes. I said, can you just tell me what you did? I said, sure. So we're in Iran, and so this is where you wear the hajib and all the, the Muslim gear. We're walking around getting into conversations, and we would just ask people, would you like to know who the real Isa is, the real Jesus? So that's what they call him, and I think it's Arabic. They call him Isa. Would you like to know who the real one is? Numerous people all around Tehran said what? Yes. Yes. It's about eight wrong answers in a row from you, Omari. But I like you, though, so that's fine with me. You just keep working. And uh, they said yes. So they would share with them uh, about the real Jesus, and then would you like, and they had an Arabic um, New Testament or Gospel of John, and we'd give them one. I said, I said, ladies, you got arrested for that? Well, well, we didn't give out just one. I'm like, well, so what did you do?